good morning. Welcome to uh, B-Sides Las Vegas, obviously. If this is not your final destination, please deboard the airplane and find somewhere else because you've definitely broken the time loop continuum. Uh, this is F Your Machine Learning Model by Colt Blackmore. A few announcements before we begin. We'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor Adobe, our gold sponsors, uh, Blue Cat Prex Trek, Toyota, it's their support that makes this conference possible. Please silence your cell phones, and as a courtesy for your speakers, if you're going to ask a question, please move to the microphone, raise your hand when you're ready, we'll call on you. And to alleviate some of the time crunch we had getting things set up, hand it over. Thank you. All right, how's that volume? Can't hear me, can't hear me? That's just mean. All right, we still got people wandering in, but that's all right. I'm going to meander a bit at the beginning here. So I have a theory about uh, why I ended up going first, so I'll, I'll attempt to describe it. Uh, I was looking at the schedule this morning, and there are, by my count, uh, Baker's Dozen talks here in Ground Truth over the next couple days. They aren't all about machine learning, but a bunch of them are uh, about a third, actually exactly a third and I can only assume that uh, maybe some impish organizer made that decision with the implicit understanding that we would start things off with a bang by uh, let's say crapping on machine learning from a great height <laughs> for the life of me I can't figure out what could possibly lead somebody to uh, such a belief certainly not uh, the title of the talk uh, or, or the description uh, but, as a matter of fact, uh, I have nothing but love in my heart for machine learning. So, rather than do a, a typical sort of speaker intro, uh, I'm going to do an origin story. And I'm actually really curious to see if my experience here is unique, or if it's actually pretty common with uh, all of you who do data science-y stuff. So, a show of hands, how many of you remember the exact moment that you first encountered machine learning? That's way fewer than I thought. Uh, interesting. All right, Let, let's whittle it down still a little bit. I'm, I'm curious if anybody's going to be left. Um, so for those of you who just raised your hand, uh, if you found your way to machine learning on your own, uh, like it wasn't a, a school assignment or a task you were given at work or something like that, uh, put your hand back up. That feels like more hands than there were before. You guys are, are, are ter terrible audience. Ridiculous. Um, but that's good. All right, so we, we have something in common. Uh, I also remember the exact moment I first encountered machine learning. Uh, there used to be a website called Gamma Sutra. It was a video game industry site, so not like for fans of video games, but for people who worked or at least aspired to work uh, in the industry. And sometime back around 2009-ish, I don't remember the year, the, the date, obviously, exactly, but I, I remember the moment. Uh, they published an article on this new thing that people were starting to use in video games called machine learning. And the only thing I remember about that article is the example that they led off with because it was so damn cool. So there was a hospital in Canada. I'm uh, almost positive it was the Toronto Hospital for Sick Children, but the article is long since gone from the internet, so I, I can't verify that. But I'm pretty sure that's what it was. They're attached to the University of Toronto. And they were using machine learning to detect when kids would get sick before it actually happened. And again, this is 2009, right? So the state of the art at that point, uh, compared to today, not so good. Um, it was like a basic time series model. The feature space was quite small. I want to say it was around two dozen features. If I put you guys on the spot right now and asked you to name features we could use for some kind of model like this, they were using the exact kinds of things that you would think of, right? It was heart rate. It was temperature, oxygen levels, skin conductance, uh, blood pressure, those kinds of things, right? So about two dozen of those. And with that in place, they were able to determine with a reasonable degree of accuracy, right? 70 to 80%, about 24 hours in advance when one of these kids would become symptomatic, right? It's not like you're not figuring out that a kid's gonna get sick before they're sick. You're figuring out that they're already sick. They're just not showing it yet. And of course, by knowing that 24 hours in advance, you can apply early care, you can uh, reduce the impact of the illness, and like the long and short of this is literally saving babies, right? That's, uh, I think we could all agree, not uh, a bad thing. So machine learning, 
uh, actually pretty cool. Um, that was, to that point in my life as a technical person, probably the coolest thing I'd heard of. I, I didn't have a, any kind of background in statistical methods at that point. I don't think I'd even heard of linear regression, for example. Um, so I, I didn't know anything. But it was an interesting enough example to dive right in and start working on this stuff. And so uh, a year and, and change maybe later, uh, I made my first malware detection model and, and it worked uh, quite well. So this was 2010 and uh, well enough, uh, in fact, that about five years later, uh, when I was working at Palo Alto Networks, uh, we took that thing that I'd built five years before and uh, kind of a stripped down version of it that wasn't quite as good. And we shipped that in a couple of different products. So. Again, machine learning, literally saving babies, uh, more or less built my whole career on it. Uh, I can't say too many mean things really, like nothing, for, nothing in my heart but love for, for machine learning. Uh, it, it's pretty great. But, there's got to be a but, right? So, but, machine learning is not the best solution to every problem. In fact, there are whole classes of problems where machine learning isn't even a good solution. And, and actually, there are cases where you can prove this mathematically. So uh, you can look at things like inapproximability results, and uh, in certain instances, you can prove that machine learning is just going to be a terrible approach to a problem because the answer it gives you can't be guaranteed to be more than like 50% of the optimal answer or 60% of the optimal answer. So that's just kind of how things are. Meanwhile, there is this big old wide world of AI out there beyond machine learning often very different from machine learning, but sometimes similar, that in a lot of these cases where machine learning is not effective, can be used to tackle those same problems and can do it better than machine learning can, right? And so what I've been wondering over the last five or six years, uh, as I've become more familiar with these other areas of AI, is what the hell is going on in cybersecurity where we don't hear people talking about these other methods, we don't see them using these other methods, why is everybody so fixated on machine learning? And we could speculate a lot of different reasons why that might be the case, but the long and short of it is, like, this is, this is where we are. Um, I think a good microcosm of the problem is actually uh, self-driving. And since I started with a clown slide, I figured we might as well have another clown. And every clown deserves a nose, so there you go, Elon. Uh, self-driving, if you ask, you know, Joe on the street, or even probably the average technical person, they're going to just immediately associate that with uh, machine learning, right? And, and we know that that's not entirely unreasonable. Machine learning is a big part of what goes on in self-driving, but is very far from the only part. So if there are sort of three foundational systems that exist in self-driving, machine learning is really responsible for one of them, sort of foundationally, right? So the perception systems, the, the car's ability, or whatever you're driving, I guess it doesn't have to be a car, but its ability to, to see, to sense its surroundings, to know there's a sign and it's a stop sign or a yield sign or a stop light, to see lanes and lane markers, to see other cars, all these kinds of things, right? Machine learning drives all of that. So it's totally fair to associate ML with self-driving, sure. But it's only one of these three core systems, and the others are equally interesting, and we can find ways to apply them, like meaningful ways to apply them uh, to cybersecurity. So, for example, planning systems are quite important. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, automated planning or AI planning, which has fewer syllables, um, planning systems create a logical representation of the world and our capabilities within it to allow us to reason about how to achieve things within that world. So, Really basic example, I wish I had like an attached mic so I could move around the room to try to illustrate this better, but um, we do automated planning, or human planning, I guess, in our heads all day long, every day. Um, if I have a goal, which is say to advance to the next slide, right, I have multiple ways I can do that. I brought a clicker thinking I might be able to walk around, and so if I was over there, I could use the clicker to do it. Uh, the other option, of course, is to be at the laptop, and then I can use the keys, like that works too. All of those actions I could take have their own dependencies. I can't use the clicker if the battery's dead. I can't press the key if I'm on the other side of the room, so my location and the location of the laptop come into play. But this is what planning is, right? It's a big logical representation of the world and a system for navigating that and being able to achieve things within that world. So we're going to talk a bunch more about that. The third pillar of self-driving is control systems. Uh, control systems are really where the rubber meets the road, right? So if Planning tells you when to change lanes and when to turn right and left. It's sort of like the Google Maps of this whole thing. Uh, the control system is the thing that hits the gas, hits the brakes, turns the steering wheel. 
And these are usually formula formulated as uh, mathematical optimization problems, usually. Uh, and they have some kind of physics-based constraints, right? So like gas brakes turning the steering wheel, sure. But if you hit the gas too hard, you might fishtail and run into a wall. If you brake too hard, you have problems. If you steer too hard, you have problems. So physical constraints come into play there, and you get some, some really interesting problems. My uh, favorite example, actually, of uh, control systems from, let's say, the last decade actually has nothing to do with cars. It comes from uh, SpaceX, another Musk company, uh, and the vertical landings of rockets, which are just a, a hellacious uh, control system uh, optimization problem. So. Of course, Elon Musk wants everybody to think that he's Tony Stark and he solves all these problems himself. We know that that is not the case. In fact, we know exactly uh, who at SpaceX is responsible for uh, solving this problem, making things happen. It is another Blackmore. No relation to this Blackmore that I know of. So Lars Blackmore, formerly of NASA, JPL, uh, left. He worked on a team there that explored this kind of stuff. Now he's at SpaceX leading the team there that explores this kind of stuff. And he is the, uh, the main guy who's been responsible for making uh, the vertical landings of the SpaceX, uh, SpaceX rockets real. And the way he went about that, and the people he worked with at NASA went about it, and the other people at SpaceX, the way they all as a team went about it, is really, really interesting. So if you're familiar with mathematical optimization, you probably already know uh, there are these two sort of broad categories of functions that you uh, generally have to deal with. One of those categories is convex functions. Uh, convexity is a really nice property for a function to have. Uh, it means that when you look at the uh, solution surface for the function, you get a nice bowl shape like this. So like if you dropped a marble in at any point on the function, it's going to fall down to the bottom and rest there. It's really easy to find whatever optimum of the function that you care about, right? So it's, it's nice and easy to deal with. Then you have the sort of hormonal teenager function where it's non-convex, it is all over the damn place. Uh, you really just have to watch yourself around it because it gets angry for no reason. Uh, all that kind of stuff. In this case, if you were to drop a marble in from an arbitrary point in the function, you have no idea where it's going to come to rest, right? It could be a local minimum, it could be a global minimum, it could be all over the place. When it's a, an important problem like landing rockets, wherever it lands, like it might be good enough and you land your rocket safely, but it also might not be good enough and your rocket explodes. Uh, and there aren't people on the rocket, so that's not the end of the world, but it's also not exactly the goal that you're hoping to achieve. So. What Lars and the NASA folks and the SpaceX folks figured out is a way to relax the non-convex function of the hellacious rocket landing problem into a convex version, right? We call that a relaxation of the function. And this isn't uh, particularly interesting in itself because the way that you do mathematical optimization is often to find relaxations and solve those and use those to bound the other function and just sort of zero in uh, on the ultimate answer. But what they figured out how to do was find a relaxation where when you find the solution for the relaxed version, it's guaranteed to also be a global solution for uh, the original problem, which is pretty damn cool. So instead of trying to tackle something like this with neural networks where you have no guarantees around the results, you have to figure out how, how do I even run this in a rocket, uh, doing things that rockets do, which are maybe not amenable to you know holding NVIDIA GPUs or whatever. Uh, they found a precise math mathematical way to uh, approach it, um, and now they land rockets like, you know, three times a week or, or whatever. Like, it's kind of routine for them. So we're not going to talk about uh, control systems per se today, but we are going to talk more about mathematical optimization because it is an important tool in our toolbox for dealing with uh, security problems. But we are going to start with uh, automated planning, which uh, is a lot of fun because it's linked to video games. So. Um, Automated planning is not new. It's kind of an ancient and venerable field. People are still doing like cutting edge research in it. Most of that deals with real time systems. So things like self-driving, robotics, um, that's where all the hard problems are because in real time to be navigating a world, reasoning logically about it, right? That's not a trivial thing to do. So cool, cool work is being done there. But the area where I was first introduced uh, to AI planning and where I've spent the most time with it uh, is is video games, because you can do really cool stuff with this uh, in video games. So the example I want to call your attention to is the game Fear. This is not a new game. If you're curious, it's 20 years old, uh, I think originally published in 2003. The AI lead on Fear is a dude named Jeff Orkin. He went on to do his PhD at MIT, 
and is, uh, turned out to be quite the kind of AI and computer science guy. Uh, but back at this point in his life, uh, he was building AI for, for video games. And so what he did is he looked at the way that people did AI in games up to that point, which is really, really basic. It's things like uh, behavior trees or finite state machines, which have to be manually, painstakingly, explicitly encoded by human beings. It's a terrible, terrible approach. Uh, and he didn't like it. And uh, the results that it, it delivered, you know, like didn't like those, nobody likes those. So he started by taking a system from Stanford called STRIPS, if you're familiar with it. It's the, uh, it's the Stanford Research Institute planning system, STRIPS. And he, uh, so to speak, stripped a bunch of stuff out of it and then enhanced it with some other stuff to make it work in video games. And from there, he was able to build a system that basically blew everybody's hair back. Uh, people, even today, they go back and they play the original Fear game and they feel like when they're playing against the computer, they're actually, they're actually playing against other human beings. Like it, it has a, a real sort of life-like quality to it. Um, it's very dynamic uh, and, and, and interesting. Right? It just feels like there's somebody else on the other side of this thing uh, to the point that it, it even weirds some people out a little bit. So the reason we know so much about fear actually is because uh, Jeff did a talk like this at the Game Developer Conference. He published a paper on it. That paper was called Three States and a Plan, the AI of Fear. I encourage anybody who's interested to go read it because it's, it's very approachable. But uh, the long and short of it is pretty simple. Um, when you boil AI planning down to its core, it's really just a few things, right? You have states. States can be as simple as basic propositional logic, right? So you can have variables, X, Y, or meaningful names. They can be true or false, or you can give them ternary values, give them unknown, put unknown or, or null in there. Um, you can also be much more specific, right? You can make planning as complex as you want it to be. So um, a state could be coordinates in a coordinate system. It could be temperature in a room. It could be a color. It could be really anything you want to, uh, to reason about, right? You can could, you could build it however you want. So you've got your states, and then you have actions. So actions are things that you can do within the world that generally are going to transform one state into another state, right? So if I, don't want, if I want to advance the slide, whether I use the clicker or the keyboard, uh, I take the action to advance it, and now I've changed the state from the previous slide to the new slide, right? So it's just a transformation for, uh, for states. And then you combine these two things together using logic to get these really complex, interesting, emergent uh, behaviors. So the way that works is you have your initial state, which would be like the state of this room as it is right now. And you have a goal state, which is whatever changes I would like to make to the room. Then I look at all the actions that are available to me to make those changes. And I reason about how to execute from those actions to make the changes real. And now I've transformed the state of the room to whatever I want it to be, right? It's, it's pretty straightforward. The, uh, the implementation that they did for fear, they gave it an awesome name. It's called GOPE. I like it so much that there's a dedicated slide for it. There's no reason for there to be. I just spent an hour with Mid Journey trying to get it to make text, and it was absolutely worth it. It's like goop and soap put together, really clean slime. I don't know, but I love it. So uh, Gop, Gop is really cool, and I, I wanted uh, to have a video to show you guys so you can kind of get a, a feel for how dynamic these really simple implementations of AI planning are. The problem is when you take like the first-person shooter version, unless you're the one playing the game, it's just a, it's a lot of visual data to process, right? It's not easy to make sense of. Uh, what I found instead, which is actually kind of awesome, is uh, some random person on Reddit, it's like a hobbyist game developer, had been struggling to get AI to work uh, in the hobby project that he was working on. Uh, had done finite state machines, had done behavior trees, had done all these classic things. None of them were working really well. And so uh, this person discovered Gope and did a quick implementation and was just like, holy crap, this works really, really well. So they made a video and then they wrote it up on, posted it to Reddit. It was like, you guys, you don't understand. Everybody should be using this. It was more or less the tone of it. It's, it's easy to Google, you guys can find it. But so uh, I'm just gonna play a quick 20 second clip from that video so you can kind of see what was going on. Um, I'm not sure how legible that text is for you guys, but what we got here is we have the AI agent in the bottom right, we've got the human player in the top left. You can see some of the state variables, mostly Boolean, that the AI agent is interested in and playing with. Um, and you'll see those change over time as things happen once I start playing. And uh, you can see in the top the goal of the agent and the plan that it's going to implement to achieve that goal. So in the beginning, it's just chilling out because it doesn't know there's an enemy. Once it becomes aware of an enemy, 
it has to go through a process. It's like, it's okay, I gotta make sure that I can see the enemy so that I can take aim at the enemy so that I can shoot the enemy. And then when the human player disarms the AI agent, it's like, well, crap, I can't shoot you without a gun, right? So now I have to go get a gun. Nobody told it that it needs to go get a gun. It's figuring that out based on the fact that it wants to shoot and it needs a gun to do that. And this is all happening, you know, every tick of the video, um, this planning process is being carried out. So I'm just gonna play it, 20 seconds, and you'll, you'll get a sense of how it goes. See, takes the gun away. So the point here isn't that this is like the most amazing game AI you've ever seen. Like obviously it's just somebody's little, little hobby project, right? The point is this is trivial to do in an afternoon and the behavioral complexity that emerges out of it is just completely disproportionate to the difficulty of building it. Like it's a really powerful kind of system. All right, so let's move on. Why the hell am I talking about video game AI uh, at a cybersecurity conference? Uh, the answer is uh, because uh, a few years ago, eight years ago, something like that, early 2010s, this new product category emerged in security called SOAR, Security Orchestration Automation and Response. And SOAR sold itself as kind of, uh, it was gonna be, I don't know, the messiah of security. It was gonna overlay all of your existing security products. It was gonna help them talk to each other via APIs so that you could take data from one place and use it to execute actions in another place. And it was just gonna make security amazing. Um, that's how it positioned itself, uh, at least. The reality turned out to be a little bit less impressive. Um, the automation <laughs> that SOAR provides uh, has to be manually constructed, right? So it's the video game equivalent of the finite state machines. If you use SOAR, you have to go make these playbooks yourself. That's what they call them, playbooks. They're workflows. Uh, it's a painstaking thing to have to do, uh, to ask understaffed, underpowered security teams to go do this uh, realistically. Like, they're not going to do it. And so what happened with SOAR, I mean, there were some really big companies and some big exits, right? The top two, uh, Phantom and Demisto, they exited to uh, Splunk and Palo Alto Networks, respectively, for almost a billion dollars combined but they don't have that many customers. Like there aren't that many companies out there using this stuff because it's just too damn hard, right? Too damn hard. So this is what we ended up with. So I thought uh, a fun thing to do, because as far as I know, this still has not been done right, in my opinion. A fun thing to do would be uh, to build a little AI planning system around SOAR today so we can kind of see how it would work. There are any number of open source libraries we could use for that. I'm actually not going to use any of them. Uh, because there are some unique characteristics to security and composing APIs where we want like a high degree of parallelism and, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, it's easier to roll our own in this particular case, but um, there's good stuff. If you like Lisp, there's Shop3 out there. If you like Python, there's a library called FastDown or there's lots of good stuff. Uh, one though I did explicitly want to call your attention to is NASA because again, space and rockets and robots are, are cool stuff. Um, on GitHub, NASA slash Europa, you can see the planner that NASA has been using in a variety of different uh, space missions for 24, 25-ish years now. Uh, it's still around, it's still kicking. They use it for lots of interesting stuff, a bunch of Mars missions. Uh, even today, it's what they use to uh, control the solar arrays on the International Space Station uh, because that's how it powers up, right? So uh, they use the Europa engine for that. It's pretty cool, the code is there. So you can actually go and play with the planner that NASA uses to drive robots on Mars. It's just there. We're not going to do that, though. We're going to do something else. All right, so let's get into it. Now, a warning here. I have something like uh, 120 slides. And it's a lot of code, and uh, when we get to the next part, a lot of equations. We don't have time to like linger on every little line, every little equation. So don't worry too much about catching all the details. The important thing is the high-level concepts, right? So I just uh, focus maybe more on, on what I'm saying and not trying to make sense of everything that's going on here. And uh, I, think, I think we'll be OK. So we're gonna build a little planning system. Well, I've already built a little planning system, but we're gonna define some things that it can do and then see what happens. Um, so the way that we create states in the system is to define uh, enumeration values. So we're gonna start with just one, ATO risk. If you've never heard ATO before, it's account takeover. All right, so there's some risk that we're aware of of account takeover. There was a phishing attack or something like that. And uh, what I'll often do is so that we don't, we don't have to write conditions and effects out longhand every time, is just declare a variable, in this case, account at risk. Uh, so we have some shorthand for how we're gonna reason and, and talk about these things. Okay, so we've got our one state. Uh, now we're gonna give the planner some actions that it can execute on. So we're gonna start with two. We're gonna say you have the action 
uh, where you can force a user to reset their password. That's a useful thing to be able to do to uh, reduce risk. And you have the action to force a logout, so to terminate any active sessions for a given account. And that can also help you uh, reduce the risk of account takeover. We don't want our planner to only be able to act on the risk that we tell it is there. So we're also going to give it an action that allows it to go and find risk on its own. So in this case, we're going to let it talk to a firewall where it can see, hey, did uh, any of the users behind my firewall click on a URL that we know to be a phishing site? And if we see that, then we know that there's risk and, and we can act on it, right? Straightforward. So we can plug all of this into the planner. We give it our three actions. The start state has nothing in it, right? So no, no conditions to start with. And our goal is to uh, mitigate risk, like right? eliminate the risk. So note that there is no risk in the start condition, but the goal is to eliminate it. So now the planner is forced to go find risk to eliminate if it wants to achieve its goal, which is a useful thing to have it, have it doing. All right, so, so what does this end up looking like? Well, we have our start and we have our goal. And uh, depending on the size of what you're dealing with, you might want to have heuristic searches. There are a lot of different things you can do here, right? But this is a fairly small plan. So we're just going to combinatorially explode the plan space so we can see all of it sitting there. We can see the logical relationships between steps of the plan. And then we can run something like a shortest path algorithm like A star, and it will find a way to get from our start to our goal if there is a way, right? If a way is available. So in this case, uh, it's going to go to the firewall, find the bad thing, force the password reset, reach the goal. Pretty straightforward. The thing here is, this is like a standard linear planning type of thing to do, but we don't really want that in security. If I have two or 50 different ways of mitigating risk, I probably want to run them all. I don't care if, if just one gets the job done. Like, I just want to execute everything and I want to do it in parallel. I don't want to have serialization of actions. I don't want to be limited in terms of, of what I can execute. So at this point, I go into the, the baby planning system that I'm building, and I just make it do everything everywhere all at once, right? We're going to win an Oscar with this planner. That's, that's the goal. So at that point, now it's just going to do all the things, right? So it gets to the firewall. It finds the bad, uh, the bad URL. Now it's simultaneously going to force the password reset, log the user out, and now we've reached our goal. Now this is a little bit of, of nonsense, uh, and I say that because uh, firewalls are a little bit of nonsense, right? Most traffic these days is encrypted. Most people are not decrypting with their firewalls, so the firewalls aren't actually seeing anything. A firewall as a source of data is not super interesting, with apologies to my friends at Palo Alto Networks. So we want to integrate uh, some additional sources of data here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to endpoints. So some, not nearly enough, but some EDR products uh, will actually log every single URL a user visits on their devices and just throw it all up into the cloud. We don't actually know if these URLs are good or bad or something in the middle, uh, but we know that the user visited them. So we're going to start by defining some new states that let us keep track of whether or not a URL is known to be phishing, uh, whether or not a user has visited it, and whether or not we sandbox it in Cuckoo or something like that. Uh, and then we're going to start adding new actions. So here's our action to uh, go to the endpoint product, the EDR, and uh, start pulling URLs. Pretty straightforward. But then we need to enrich them, right? We need to figure out, is this URL a bad URL? Is it good? Is it in the middle? Like, what, what's actually going on? One way we can do that is to ask VirusTotal. And if VirusTotal has seen the URL before, well, isn't that nice? Now we know it's bad, maybe. And uh, we can take action on it. But maybe VirusTotal doesn't know anything, right? Maybe it's never seen it before. That would be pretty standard for VirusTotal in my experience. So maybe we also have a, a local solution we can use, a Cuckoo instance, whatever, right? Our sandbox, some other analysis system, doesn't really matter. In that case, we can ask that system, hey, do you know if the URL is bad? And if it knows, it'll give us an answer. This time, though, if it doesn't know, we also have the ability to submit the URL to the, uh, the sandbox. And then it will determine on its own whether it's good or bad and uh, get back to us with the news. And again, we can take action. So now we're going to define a new problem, new planner, throw all our actions in there. But the goal has changed. Instead of trying to mitigate risk, now we are trying to figure out, is this URL that we have seen bad? Or do we not need to worry about it? That's the new goal. So how does this play out? All right, we've got our start action and our end action. And if we hit the firewall again, Nothing is going to change, right? It's going to tell us it's bad. Now we know. Easy peasy. We're done. When we go to the endpoint, though, we don't know automatically if it's good or bad. So the planner is going to say, OK, what can I do to enrich what I know about this URL? Well, I can go to VirusTotal. 
And if Iris Total knows, we've reached our goal, and again, everything is good. But if Iris Total doesn't know, we need to look somewhere else. So now we've got our sandbox system. Hey, sandbox, have you seen this URL? Do you know if it's bad? And if it knows, then again, we've reached our goal. But if it doesn't know, now we have this extra step. The planner says, okay, well, now we can submit it, right? We can figure out if it's good or bad dynamically, feed that back into the system, and that takes us uh, to where we want to go. Now we've made a determination. Is it good? Is it a bad URL? Everything is going exactly as we would like it to go. Okay, so now we're, we're starting to cook. We're going to do one last round of enhancements here. We're going to add a couple things. First of all, when we're getting into the business of detecting bad stuff, it's not enough to just resolve it on the back end and be done. We want to alert somebody that, hey, we found a bad thing and we're going to take some actions to resolve it, right? So we're going to add a new action, alert visited phishing URL, and that's going to take care of that for us. It's also going to take care of registering the fact that there was account takeover risk so that we can then take actions on it. And we're going to add a new mitigation option. So this action auto purge similar messages means if we find a bad thing, we could reach into our email server, like Exchange, for example, find any messages that might contain that bad thing and yank those back out. Okay. Yank those back out. Uh, and if we do that, well, we've protected a whole bunch of users who weren't even impacted yet, right? So it's, it's kind of handy. Uh, so now we define a new problem through all of the ingredients in the pot here. We're going to make a, a nice stew. And uh, again, no starting conditions. We're going to go out and find the risk ourselves. And our goal is back to mitigating the risk, right? So now we're not just looking for is the URL good or bad. We're back to seek and destroy mode for the planner. All right, so what does it come up with here? It's going to start with the plan that we just had, basically. The only difference is instead of ending with figuring out good or bad, it's going to do something a little extra. It's going to issue that alert. And that is the first step of the second part of the process. When we issue the alert from there, we're trying to proceed toward our actual goal, which is mitigating the risk. And now we have three different ways we can do that. And again, we can execute all of them in parallel. So we can force the password reset, boom, reach the goal. Yank the bad stuff out of exchange, boom, reach the goal. Force uh, the account logout, terminate all the active sessions, boom, reach the goal. And that's how you can use automated planning to make SOAR great again, right? We're really just scratching the surface here, but hopefully you can kind of see, you can imagine maybe what it would be like to have a security operations team with something like this running on the back end, overlaying however many dozens of products they, they're using, all their data sources, the ability to take actions for them, whether it's in real time or human in the loop through JIRA tickets, whatever it might be. But you can imagine how powerful uh, that might be and how it would enable a whole bunch of security teams that don't use SOAR today because it's too damn hard to actually benefit from it. So this, uh, I think, is something that has to be built, like somebody should build it. My hope is that maybe somebody in this room will go build it because I don't have time right now. Uh, so if anybody's in the market for startup ideas, please uh, email me. I will be happy to explain more. I will send you some of this demo code. I uh, will do whatever it takes to help drive you toward the goal because whether it's an open source project or, or a company, right, this needs to exist. Cool, cool. All right, now we're moving on. Mathematical optimization, part two. My opinion on security problems kind of boils down to having the ability to translate a problem into different representations is the ultimate superpower. So every form you might give a particular problem is going to lend itself to different kinds of solutions. So by being able to translate the problem, you get access to a bunch of different kinds of tools for solving the problem. And one of the most compelling sets of tools is uh, math. You can translate problems into mathematical structures, and when you do that, all of the ways that human beings have developed over the last two or 3,000 years for wrangling mathematical structures present themselves to you as tools for solving your problem. And that is a very powerful thing to be able to do. So I'm gonna start this off by doing something incredibly stupid. And as your attorney, I, I recommend that you absolutely don't do it, but it's still fun. We're gonna take that planning problem and turn it into a function and optimize it and uh, it's ridiculous, but it, it kind of shows how this works. And then we'll, we'll do a more interesting problem after. Okay, so how do we turn a planning problem into a function? Well, we need some helper variables. So we're going to create, uh, you can think of these as vectors or ordered sets. It doesn't really matter, but they're just uh, sequences of integers. They're going to represent indexes into other structures. And we'll have one to re represent uh, our actions, our conditions, and our effects. 
mnemonically A, C, and E, pretty, pretty easy to follow. Uh, for simplicity's sake, ease of reference, we're going to say that our starting action, which is always the first one, is sigma, and the goal action, which is always the last one, we're just going to call that gamma. All right? We need uh, some matrices to look some things up in, so we're going to have one for action conditions, and this will be a zero if an action doesn't have the condition, and one if it does. Straightforward. We're going to do the same thing for whether or not a given action satisfies a condition. So we have these two matrices filled with zeros and ones that represent actions that have conditions and actions that satisfy conditions. The last thing we need is our decision variable. Now, the output of a planning problem, as we saw before, is effectively a graph. And so the data structure we can use to represent that is an adjacency matrix. That's kind of the standard, well, one of the standard, two standard ways to represent graphs as data structures anyway. So here, here's an example one. This is going to be uh, our actions as rows, our actions as columns. When there's a zero, that means the two actions don't have an edge between them. They don't connect. When there's a one, they do. So in this example case, we see action one connecting to two and three, two and three connecting to four, four connects to nothing because four is the goal. The goal never connects to anything else. So the bottom row here is actually always going to be all zeros. If you were to draw this like we did earlier, it would look like this, right? So that's our adjacency matrix. Now we're in a position to define the objective function. And this is a function that we want to maximize or minimize uh, to help us reach our optimization goal. There are a lot of different ways you could approach this particular problem, but what I've done is I said, I want to maximize the number of actions I have connecting to my goal state. And that on its own is not going to do anything helpful. It's just going to have every other action connect to the goal state uh, so that you're, the whole matrix is going to be ones basically. Uh, it's, it's not super useful. The way that we make it useful is by now applying constraints over what connections are ultimately allowed. So we're going to need some helpers and some other things to, to make this work. First, we want a count of the conditions that each action has. So we already know which conditions it has. We want the count. Uh, so we'll call that a vector. We'll call that vector u uh, over uh, the actions that the, uh, or the conditions that the action has. We also want uh, a helper matrix uh, that we'll call L for whether or not a connection between two actions is legal. Uh, we're going to define this with uh, disjunctive logic. So there are two cases where an edge is legal. One is if the target action has no conditions, then it's allowed to connect to our source, our initial state, right? The other is if the source action satisfies a condition of the target. In that case, a connection is also allowed. So that's L sub IJ. And then the last piece we need is a count of, for a given candidate graph, are all of the conditions of a given action satisfied or only some of them? And so we count up the ones that are satisfied. And so the final restriction we have here, uh, x sub ij, uh, that requires the uh, edge to be legal for it to be selected. And then it also requires the count of conditions that an action has to equal the count of uh, actions that are satisfied for that condition. And if all of these things hold, then we can construct the graph. It will satisfy the planning problem, not as well as the graph-based approach, but it works, right? It works pretty well. Uh, if it was a big enough graph, it would become horrifically inefficient. And so again, you should never do this, but you can do it. You can turn almost anything into a function. And, and this is actually, so I, I have kind of an ulterior motive beyond functions being fun. For talking about them, uh, show of hands, who recognizes this function? I tried to make it a little bit obvious with the first two, but I'm talking about the last one. So y equals sigma lambda sigma lambda x hands. Really? All right. I, I expected way more than that. Um, this is useful. Who, nope, wrong direction. Who recognizes that? Oh, I don't believe you. Everybody has seen a neural network drawn this way. Absolutely all of you, I do not believe you. Um, so this is the way that we normal, normally see like a basic multilayer perceptron uh, illustrated. It's kind of the standard way. But the fact is, it's also this, right? A neural network is just a function. When you train a neural network, you're optimizing a function. You're using different methods than we would use for our graph just now. Like the neural networks is usually not doing a lot of uh, discrete optimization, for example. But they're closely related, right? We talked about extended family of uh, AI methods before. Like they, they all kind of go together. So this is one place where you can see how close these things are to each other, even though they can be used in very, very different ways. So that's all I wanted to mention. Okay, let's move on to uh, more of a, 
it's going to become a real world example. It's not going to start out as a real world example, so just bear with me. You are William Adama, commander of the Battlestar Galactica, and it is your job to save humanity from the Cylon threat, but the Cylons have just FTL jumped into space near you, and they're uh, attacking and attempting to wipe humanity out. Is that a 10? 10, okay, 10 minutes. That's good, we're at a good spot. They're gonna try to wipe you out. Now you have a very specific kind of optimization problem you're facing. You want to optimally assign all of the weapons that you have at your disposal in a way that's going to minimize the threat of the enemy that you're now facing, right? So let's say you have uh, machine guns and cannons and missiles and fighters and bombers and whatever else you might have available. How do you assign those to the Cylon threat to eliminate it or at least minimize it so that you're able to survive and humanity can carry on. Well, this is actually one of the classic optimization problems. It's called the weapon target assignment problem. And it goes a little something like this. You have some number of weapon types, which are called W. And for each of those types, you have a count C, greater than or equal to zero. You have some number of targets, we'll call those T. And each target has a value, that's some real number, again, greater than or equal to zero. Those uh, combinations of weapon types and targets, uh, they have these two associated values. So there's a kill rate, which is the rate at which a given weapon type is able to kill a target. And then the flip side of that, uh, the survival rate, the rate at which a given target is able to survive an attack from a certain kind of weapon. All right, that's the foundation here. Then we have our decision variable, which is again a matrix. This matrix though is not a graph, it's just a count of how many weapons of a given type are we going to assign to a given target to minimize the Cylon threat. And so when you write out the uh, objective function here, it looks a little bit more complicated than the one we had before, which was more, more heavy on the constraint side. But all this really says is, look, there are two things we care about. The value of each target and the amount of damage we can inflict on that target. Targets that are high value but hard to damage might not be worth selecting. Targets that are very low value but easy to damage might not be selecting. Finding a balance between these things is the, the point of the weapon target assignment problem. There is one constraint we need to add here, which is just you can't assign more weapons of a type than you actually have. But other than that, no additional constraints on this formulation of the problem. So this time, let's actually implement it in Python. So I'm using a, a library called Pyomo. Uh, it's mainly developed by the folks at Sandia Labs, if you know them. Um, it's what's generally called an algebraic modeling language, which means you get to write Python that kind of looks like the equations that we just wrote out. Uh, and then it does all the heavy lifting for you behind the scenes and can uh, solve your optimization problem. So here we've declared all those same variables I just mentioned. I populate it with super random data because the data doesn't really matter for our purposes. And uh, you've got to declare that variable. You have to make sure that it has the proper dimensions. So we give it the two iterables, the weapon types and the targets, and make sure that the matrix has the right shape. Uh, and then we register our objective function and our constraint function. But the really interesting part is how we write those functions. So you can see the mathematical notation again here on the right, but you also have the Python version over here on the left. And notwithstanding the fact that I refuse to write code that uses variable names like X and A and C and whatever, um, it's basically the same thing, right? You've got a sum over a product, you're looking things up with indices, but the Python code looks a whole heck of a lot like math notation. And that's the point of these kinds of languages. This code, by the way, never executes. Uh, it gets uh, introspected by the Pyoma system to figure out what the mathematical structure of the function is and translate it directly into uh, the format that we need to pass over to the solver. Same thing with the constraint, right? The Python looks just like the math minus uh, naming schemes. Okay, so then we have to just uh, instantiate a solver. I'm using SCIP. Uh, until early this year, it was not an open source option, so I wouldn't have used it. But it's actually, I think, by far the best open source option for hard optimization problems. So if you're dealing with like non-convex stuff, non-linear stuff, mixed integer stuff, SCIP is really, really good, and it's Apache now, so you can use it. It's fantastic. Going to aggregate the results, going to print them out, and this is what you get, right? This is our allocation of weapon types to the various targets. This is the matrix that results. So. Assuming we have sufficient firepower, we'll be successful. We'll eliminate the Cylon threat. But of course, if you're a BSG fan, you know uh, that's not the end of the story because all of this has happened before and all of this will happen again. Okay, I promised I would make this relevant to security, so let's, let's go ahead and do that. What, what the hell are we talking about here? Well, if we change some names, get rid of weapon, 
let's call it control, as in security control. Get rid of target, we'll call that attack, as in cyber attack. So now we have a control attack assignment problem. And this is very much the kind of thing that security teams actually deal with day in and day out. They have a whole bunch of things they're being targeted by. There are a whole bunch of details of how those attacks work. They have a whole bunch of products they pay millions and millions of dollars for. And uh, they're trying to figure out how do we spend our time in the most efficient way to deploy and manage these products, to minimize, minimize the risk from the way that all of those attacks work, right? This is actually sort of a fundamental problem that security teams are, are working against. And so you can formulate the security problem as this kind of optimization problem. And when you do that, you run into interesting things like, oh, you know, that six digit standard MFA code thing that everybody does is actually not very useful. It doesn't add much security at all. Um, a fair number of people realize that at this point. So whatever, no big deal. Um, but everybody loves YubiKeys. Everybody thinks YubiKeys are like the be all end all of uh, anti-phishing, right? You can't get phished if you use a YubiKey. That's a goddamn lie. Uh, so it blocks some things, but it's uh, completely vulnerable to other things. There are no credentials in OAuth based phishing. So your YubiKey doesn't do anything. And DNS hijacking, like one of the critical features of not just YubiKeys, but let's say like uh, U2F and uh, WebAuthn, for example, is the domain validation. But if DNS hijacking is in place and you don't have certificates pinned, you don't realize that the domain you're talking to is not the domain you think you're talking to. You still get, you still get like credentials stolen or um, certificates intercepted, signed messages intercepted, uh, whatever, right? And we can just go down the line. Like Okta's great, except for when Okta's not great. Uh, firewalls are great, except for when firewalls aren't great. Uh, more firewall stuff. I spent years working on firewalls, so it's a natural example for me. But that's kind of how it goes, right? And so if you think about security as weapons and targets, it turns into a really interesting mathematical optimization problem. And if you solve it, you will find some interesting and unexpected approaches to doing the work of security, like boots on the ground work of security. And uh, you can reduce the risk to organizations uh, by pretty significant amounts. How am I doing on time? Five minutes? Oh, shit. In that case, we're gonna go ahead and talk about logic programming. I did not think we'd get here, so this has not been rehearsed. Um, logic programming, it's really cool. It's uh, kind of a meeting in the middle of uh, the previous two systems. I tried really hard to get a bot that looked like Benedict Cumberbatch and I, I failed. Midjourney just wasn't having it, so I'm sorry about that, but I still think this version of Sherlock looks pretty cool. Uh, the idea of logic programming is pretty straightforward. You define relations and then you can, these are symbolic relations, right? And then you can substitute concrete values in for parts of those, and you can basically just traverse them in whichever direction you want. So if I leave things completely symbolic, like A plus B equals C, I can ask it for uh, what turns out to be an infinite sequence of substitutions for those symbols that will satisfy the relation I've established. And so it'll just do A and B and C equal these things. It'll, it'll run forever until the heat death of the universe, right? But I can also substitute uh, some values in and then it will give me answers that achieve those values. It's doing a lot of the same kinds of work of other systems, but it's built into the language itself when you do it, right? So um, if you've never heard of any of these, there's like Prolog or the subset of Prolog, Datalog. Um, there are a couple languages that Google has built. Yetalog was the original, but the current one is called Logica, and they use that in production for their knowledge graph. They do lots of cool stuff with it. Um, one that I really like, although it's uh, built on top of Scheme, so it's very lispy, and if you don't like parentheses, I would advise you to stay away, uh, it's called Miniconron. Uh, it hasn't been around that long, but it's super cool. There is a Python version. Uh, so what I did here, I definitely don't have time to talk through it, but what I did here is, once again, I take our planning problem, show how to represent that as a series of logical relations, and have it be able to navigate those to output a planning graph based on relations. And so you can do that by declaring uh, the facts, uh, that we take from our actions and everything, defining relations like, okay, well, here's how you say that an effect satisfies a condition. Here's how you say that an action or one of the effects in an action satisfies the condition. Here's how you can say that an edge is valid. Uh, just like in the equations we saw before, there's a logical disjunction here, so there are a couple different ways to do that. Um, you can do recursive relations, so you can define something as being an ancestor if it's anywhere behind in some kind of chain. You can use that to build the concept of reachability. So from our start or our goal actions in a planning problem is a given action reachable. And if it is, we want to use that for certain things. Um, is an edge between two actions reachable? Well, to say that it is, we need both of the individual actions to be reachable and so on. You throw all that stuff together and you uh, hit print 
and it will build your planning graph for you. Again, it's not perfect. It's not as good as doing it the uh, quote-unquote correct way, the old-fashioned way. It's kind of like a weird hacky way to do it, but logic programming is pretty cool, especially for exploring data. I thought I had five minutes five minutes ago, man. You, you're really confusing me. But that's good. This means we're going to have time for Q&A. So I rushed through the logic stuff. Happy to answer questions on it. But before I do that, my robots are hella cute, and so you should applaud them. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? I, pff, your guess is as good as mine, man. Real quick. I'm in AI governance, so I know this stuff. But awesome. We've seen a lot of things in agent-based modeling uh, being promising. Uh, I was curious if you had any thoughts on that. I'm sorry, can you read the second part? Oh, agent-based modeling. Are, so, are, are, what are your thoughts on that? Because I'm seeing a lot of value coming from that for uh, controls you, and risk. Are you talking specifically about like the, the current sort of rash of concern around LLM-based things and prompt injection? Or? Just generally, like in financial, uh, financial crime, it's being used to find things that wouldn't be there absent the agent-based modeling, synthetic data, things like well, that. Well, give, give me an example. Oh, okay. Well, what you do, <laughs> it's going to be kind of hard to say it in, in the short term. But agent-based modeling, you've heard of synthetic data? Mm -hmm. Okay. Basically, that, that's, it's created by the same method. And what you do is you, <clears throat> you take an existing ground truth to training data set, and you learn from it, and you add other features, and you just you create these little agents. And they run around, and it's kind of like doing... Um, virus prediction mm -hmm. you have these agents that run around in the society and they you can determine where the virus is going to go and how fast and how much same thing with financial crime you just let it cut loose you have these little agents that, that run mm -hmm. off and do accounts and yeah. they're evil some are good and then you see how it all kind of comes together so anyway it's something i saw i've seen a lot of i'm just curious if it's not something you have a direct yeah no it's 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 a it's an interesting approach i mean we see people do that kind of uh, simulation based stuff um, in a lot of areas. One, one of the things that I think is cool about logic programming, actually, is that you can build up um, a logical representation of a network, a literal network, or something more figurative, like a financial model, and then reason about where gaps might be exploitable within that model. And uh, the way that things work, like just substituting for symbols, right? You can just iterate over all the gaps that it finds. So it's a, another approach to that. But yeah, I mean, just basically turning agents loose and letting them bang on things is, of course, a useful approach. But that's kind of like... Uh, the chaos modeling stuff that Netflix was famous for 10, 15 years ago. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so, so you, you covered a lot of ground, so I might at least uh, a subtle here that I'm uh, pursuing. Uh, what you represent in action mm -hmm. it seems like it's got a very deterministic outcome. So, how do you deal with uncertainty if you don't know that the outcome will be true or false? Like, I think we're going to be right and achieved, or when maybe. Yeah, so that's a really good question, right? We dealt with a very simplistic version of uh, the planning problem, like just Boolean variables and, and uh, actions always successful. So the question was, how do you plan under uncertainty? Which is a great question because literally, uh, so the, the seminal text uh, in the AI field for undergraduates at least is uh, AI for the Modern Age by uh, Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig. Um, and there's a chapter called Planning Under Uncertainty. It's all about this, this kind of thing. And uh, there are a lot of, well, there, there are a few different ways to approach it. Uh, one of the things I like about this kind of, of model is you can just uh, let it fail when you're doing everything in parallel. So in the, in the security context, as I constructed it, uh, if you run into a roadblock, you can just backtrack and go down uh, a different path. But as you get into more abstract kinds of states, like coordinate systems and other things that like robotics and real-time systems use, that starts to turn into a, a quite problematic thing to be able to deal, deal with. So like the, uh, the self-driving car example, they run into lots of issues there. They end up having to use a little bit of machine learning to uh, filter down some of the planning possibilities so that the actual decision-making system, which is based on reason, not statistics, can make a, a smart choice. But yeah, it's a, it's a real problem. And uh, <laughs> here you go. I think they're on the fourth or the fifth edition at this point. Yes, sir. Interesting. He follows on from a question I have is, so these are great when you actually have a, a reasonable assumption of what the constraints are with logic-based programming, or that you know what the, um, what the connections of the graphs are. 
right? But as we know in security, you know, a hidden constraint or a constraint that's missing that yep. should be there causes us all kinds of problems. So it's great when you can define when you can define this space well. What kind of solutions or approaches have you got when you think that there's kind of variability in the space or maybe constraints that you don't know or um, parts of that, you know, your weightings or your connections within a graph that should be there but you're missing? Yeah, so those are the cases where I would generally make up data, right? I would estimate what I think some of the unknowns are and generate synthetic data around it and then feed it in the same deterministic kind of system. Or if I'm using machine learning, which I still use a lot, uh, feed it into something like that too. But uh, at some point you have to make some kind of assumption. You can't build over the void. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can look back to history, you can do all kinds of stochastic things. Um, Monte Carlo stuff like you, you have options there, but at the end of the day, there are no guarantees like the things you make up might not help. So that, that's a tough one. All right. I think we are almost certainly out of time. Yeah. All right. Need to cut it. Thank you all for coming. There's my email. If you want any of this code or you want access to the slides or anything, just shoot me an email. Happy to share. Thanks guys.